Our final speaker before we go to Q, uh, Q&A today uh, is Dr. Jim Gavin. Now, I've had the both the pleasure and the challenge um, of introducing Jim uh, before, and I've got to tell you, it ain't easy. Um, there he is. There's Jim. Um, Jim's list of accomplishments is so extensive that it's actually pretty hard to know where to start. Right? But I'm going to attempt to simplify this and really cut to the heart of it. Jim is a doctor, yes, and a leader who has made so many people healthier. Right? He's a, he is the clinical professor of medicine at Emory University School of Medicine and at the Indiana University School of Medicine, because one school is just not enough for him. Um, and he currently serves as chief medical officer of Healing Our Village, right? And he's also the former president of Morehouse School of Medicine in Atlanta and former head of the ADA. Um, and he's the, re the recipient, frankly, of more awards and recognition than I could hope to list. Uh, and he makes people's lives better. Right? He is unceasingly giving with his wisdom and his guidance. And in particular, I am awed by his ability to ground this tremendous knowledge and accomplishment and expertise in utter humility and generosity and caring for people. He is our final speaker today, as I said. Please welcome Dr. Jim Gavin. Thank you so much, uh, David. That was more than uh, kind and gracious as an introduction. Um, and once again, it is my honor to stand before you as part of the Die Tribe family to engage in the demanding process of creative thinking that's designed to develop effective and embraceable strategies for reducing and eliminating barriers to prevention of diabetes, and for improving quality of life and outcomes in persons living with diabetes or otherwise affected by it. Now, this is noble and urgent work, and I thank all of you for your passionate engagement. Now, today we address the important matter of diabetes stigma, and you've heard brilliant lectures, and when you're the last speaker in the lineup, there's certainly no further need for me to define it. Here I am, the closing speaker in a, an absolutely fantastic array of speakers who have really set a high bar. Now, from all that you have heard already, there is clearly great urgency to eliminate stigma in diabetes. It is a suffocating blanket to the groundswell of hope and encouragement that should be the collective experience of persons affected by diabetes Given the rapid advancements in therapeutic interventions and glucose monitoring capability that we have witnessed in this past year alone, notwithstanding the heavy burden of the pandemic. As enigmatic as it may seem, given the circumstances of our general environment, there is much good news in diabetes. Thus, there is heightened urgency to remove all barriers that inhibit and prevent people from seeking necessary care or from fully and openly engaging in the full spectrum of work, educational and social activities, comfortably assured that they have all of the tools and capabilities for control of their diabetes and the full support of their work, family, and social communities. In short, we need to achieve the curtailment and elimination of stigma in diabetes. Now, I suffer no delusion regarding the magnitude of the challenge, and the other speakers have clearly indicated what a challenge it is we face. I have been asked to pr provide my perspectives on stigma in diabetes from the vantage point of a physician which I'm pleased to do, and you'll be happy to know I have no slides. But despite many experiences over the years of seeing the exercise of stigma and its myriad del deleterious effects in diabetes, that is not where or how my experience 
with stigma began. Many of you know that I was inspired to change my career direction from that of a PhD bench scientist to a physician scientist when I discovered that it was diabetes that was responsible for the deterioration and ultimately the death of my great grandmother, who was a beloved and revered person in my life and in the life of my family. She was so full of kindness and generosity and wisdom and was a fierce protector from the wrath of parents and grandparents alike. She was always our place of encouragement and comfort and tea cakes. And we eagerly anticipated our summer journeys from Mobile to Selma, Alabama to visit her. I vividly recall that summer when we arrived in Selma and it was not Mama Rennie bursting through the door as the first person to greet us because she was bedridden. She looked nothing like she had looked the previous summer and shockingly, one of her legs was missing. As kids, we didn't quite know what to say or do, so we mimicked the withdrawn behavior and hushed tones of the adults, all the time wondering, wondering but too reticent to ask our clearly distraught parents, what's wrong with Mama Rennie? They volunteered nothing, and we were left to piece things together as best we could. Every once in a while, we would overhear a reference to her sugar or that sugar or some reference to what the sugar was doing to Mama Rennie, and it made no sense. We surmised as kids that whatever calamity had stolen Mama Rennie's vibrancy involved terrible actions of sugar. Clearly they were leaving something unsaid because sugar was sweet and pleasant and would never do that to a wonderful person like her. It was many years later that I realized that it was diabetes. And the grown-ups did not want to discuss it out loud around us as kids. It was my first encounter with stigma. It's not likely to have been simple denial because the issue was so glaringly obvious. It was stigma. It was not a proper thing to talk about or to acknowledge. I had to learn that my great uncles, one of my sisters and other family members also had sugar, but it was never acknowledged at family gatherings or in discussions. These were early missed opportunities to learn the most rudimentary things about the disease. For in those days, it is fair to say that we didn't know much and we certainly had insufficient tools with which to address the condition. It was stigma driven heavily by fear and ignorance. But that was my first encounter with this entity, which is the target of our efforts to change the narrative and displace the practice. Let's fast forward nearly 65 years. I was taking care of some banking business at my local community bank, talking with one of the veteran executives here in small town of Oviedo. I'll call her Lisa, whom I'd gotten to know since moving here to Florida. She wanted the bank president to weigh in on our discussion, so she brought him in. Now, we had met before, so we made small talk and then proceeded to address the business matters. He left but then he returned shortly to ask me to remind him once again what it is that I did. I mumbled a few things about my career activities, but I finished by saying, I am above all else a diabetes doctor. Lisa said, diabetes? Well, Bill and I both need to, oh dear. I need to shut up, she said, I talk too much. She was clearly ready to change directions and talk about something else. He said nothing more, but simply 
said that he looked forward to talking with me further about the business matter that we had discussed. Lisa and I completed our business with her seeming more ill at ease than I had ever known her to be. And I confess that because I had a Zoom call in 20 minutes, I missed a valuable opportunity to address this professional, efficient, and very nice woman at an important point of need. Clearly, she felt she had let the cat out of the bag, had revealed some secret information about her and her boss that never should have been uttered aloud. Did she fear judgment from me? Even after I admitted I was a diabetes doctor, that was not enough to assure the comfort of a certain comradeship? Now, the more cynical might think, well, it's really very personal information. Or it might diminish their professional hauteur to be seen as having a disease of negligence or to be seen as having insufficient discipline to avoid such a disease. Now, there are even those who would surmise that because they were white and I'm black, such an admission would imply a kind of weakness that is historically to be avoided. The scourge of stigma conveys an undeserved taint to even the most basic elements of human discourse. What became clear to me in that moment was that she was suffering from the captive effects of stigma, and I had the opportunity and even the duty of providing a certain liberation, and I blew it. I wondered how many other times I had failed to address a patient's needs when they uttered things like, Doc, I know I need to do better, but sometimes it seems my best is just not good enough. So many times I have heard the resounding cries of, it's my fault, I just don't have the willpower. Or worst of all, I guess we all got to die of something. Far too many times have I witnessed the ability of stigma to drain energy, exterminate hope, and impose silence and reticence where there should be comfort and benefit of open exchange, especially since there is now so much good news to share. I have the opportunity to share the power of change and the hope that is now an incontestable reality for persons living with diabetes are affected by it. It is no longer my great grandmother's disease. I should have shared that hope with Lisa. I am pleased that I do so more often than I do not. So my behavior with Lisa and Bill was not typical. Okay, I sort of blame it on Zoom. But now I advance a different narrative about diabetes. I guess I have already started the reframing process that is so essential. And I challenge other healthcare providers to consider doing so as you have been challenged already. Diabetes is a common. Patients need to know that they are far from alone, preventable and completely controllable chronic disease. My good friend, Dr. Bill Polanski from San Diego echoes and shares my strong view that well-controlled diabetes is the leading cause of nothing. I assert that these outcomes are possible because each person has the responsibility of becoming an expert in only one case of diabetes, their own. My job and your job is to help them comfortably achieve such insights and expertise and to embrace the transparency that comes from stripping a condition of its mystery and hopelessness. Certainly it begs the question about how we should prioritize our efforts to reduce the impact of and eliminate the uh, uh, exercise of stigma. 
Should we be working harder and more smartly at reshaping the narrative, reframing as it were, and improving the awareness so that this complex yet common disease is not perceived any longer as the fault of an undisciplined lifestyle? Even though structured changes in lifestyle can be effective measures to prevent and treat it. Can this disease gain more parity with breast cancer, which is never considered the affected woman's fault. Although we depend on her vigilance and awareness to assure early detection and to promote the best possible outcomes, if we can successfully recast the very perception of diabetes, and, and we won't delve into the nuances of its complexity for the moment, might we prioritize the societal inclination towards engagement of diabetes stigma as the principal target for change? Or should we instead spend more energy on strengthening self-awareness of the individuals who are the recipients of stigma and help them become more resilient to become masters of deflective behavior so their hope and confidence are not damaged in their journey to the newer and better outcomes that are now possible. Perhaps there's no choice except to do both. We must confront the what by acknowledging, as you've heard brilliantly portrayed, that stigma is real. It is damaging and it is a barrier that diminishes the ability for the kind of progress that is now possible using the newer treatment tools and interventions. Now, it's certainly not the only barrier, but it is exceedingly common, almost cultural in its penetration and impact, and it is persistent. It has far-reaching and often lasting deleterious impact. We must confront the how by engaging in activities like these, where we seek to define strategies to better understand the dynamics of and the motivation for stigma, to inform approaches to reduce and eliminate it, while at the same time helping patients to avoid being suffocated and rendered hopeless by it. This is the part that challenges us to communicate better what diabetes is and what diabetes is not. Most importantly, this is the part that challenges us to convey the good news that derives from new insights, new discoveries, new technologies, new treatments, and extensive new data regarding better outcomes at every level of diabetes, across ages, genders, ethnicities, and durations of disease. New data and new tools allow us the opportunity to shape and promote a new narrative about diabetes, one that disempowers stigma. My view is that this is where we might want to spend the bulk of our time and energy. While I would never want to minimize the problem, I don't need to celebrate it or dissect it further when there are very smart and eloquent people who have done a fabulous job of giving clarity to the nature, extent, and impact of this problem. What is more, we can share with our patients the fact that there are many fine examples of people who have dealt with stigma and have realized the advantages of a full life with diabetes in which there is no fear of transparency, for they have achieved comfort with knowing that they are not diminished by their condition. They have affirmed that this is a controllable disease and well-controlled diabetes is the leading cause of nothing. We now have the collective testimony of Anthony Anderson, Tom Hanks, Nick Jonas, Drew Carey, Randy Johnson, Billie Jean King, Jay Cutler, Patti LaBelle, just to name a few. The why is perhaps the most straightforward of all our discussion. And here my work as a person providing the physician perspective on stigma has been made really easy. Let me quote something that you should 
probably find very familiar. Stigma is problematic and creates barriers at nearly every step of the diabetes pathway. The possibility of stigmatization and judgment discourages individuals to undergo screening and diagnosis for fear of being labeled diabetic. Once diagnosed, people with diabetes may not adhere to their medication regimen or properly monitor their blood glucose in order to avoid judgment from others. After years of living with diabetes, people with diabetes may also accumulate increasing mental and emotional stress due to the associated stigma, in turn leading to increased risk of complications and worse health outcomes. Finally, as we have learned from other social movements, and you heard this brilliantly from Joan, such as the LGBTQ rights movement, stigma, discrimination, and concealment hamper our ability to enact effective collective action to bend the curve on the diabetes epidemic. Thus, it is impossible to make significant progress in diabetes without first eliminating stigma among people with and without diabetes. This should sound familiar because this is an eloquent statement of why we are addressing this issue and it is the closing statement in our briefing document for this meeting. Maybe, just maybe, I shall go back to Lisa and Bill and suggest that it would be nice if we had a talk. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Jim. Uh, once again, Jim continues to lead the way, this time <clears throat> not with a strategic arc, but with an honest view of his own behavior, right? And I think, you know, I'm, I am moved again and, and thinking a little bit about um, Ibram X. Kendi's book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, and thinking about the evaluation. He's said, he says we must combat racism in all places, including perhaps most importantly in ourselves. Right, and, and to think about this notion that all of us, even though we may be advocates, we might we might care deeply and not wish any harm. We're wishing to support and do well by each other. And yet we are part of the story and part of the stigma. Um, and there might there may be ways that we can all improve. 